the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative. I welcome you to this symposium, to the Plastics in the Environment, Science Meets Public Policy. Uh, we're, we're so happy to have you with us, uh, whether it's good morning or good afternoon or wh whatever time zone you're in, um, welcome. I'm gonna uh, deliver a, a few remarks before I pass it over design and engineering of new polymers for uh, realistic and, and, and practical biodegradability. Uh, we've also taken the approach for um, new systems and approaches to recycling. And the, the focus on policy was part of our agenda from day one. We, didn't, we, we were very intent on not repeating the mistakes of engineering and science development of the past and leaving the policy to others and leaving it as a, as a second stage or a latter stage. We really wanted to embed it within the, the initial work um, on a new kind of uh, world of plastics, uh, a more environmentally benign world of plastics. So the policy workshop um, is on equal footing and is running in parallel with the technology and science that we are supporting in plastic pollution. I could say more, but I want to move on because I want to... Um, uh, conference, and uh, I do want to recognize the crisis that we're in, the fact that we are all ensconced at, at home, the um, turbulent times that we are part of, and yet the opportunities that that crisis has presented. It really is an honor to, to be here today and to welcome Juliette Cabera, who is joining us from Kigali, from Rwanda, and will share the story of uh, Rwanda as a leader in uh, environmental governance and policy, in designing it and implementing it. Uh, so I will uh, lead the conversation with, with Juliette. I'll introduce her in a second. Kigali, Rwanda. It's a pleasure for me to be here and a pleasure for me to share some of Rwanda's story in the journey of environment and climate change, you know, management. So um, for us, uh, Marie, I think this is an interesting question. For us, the environment policy, um, you know, being part of the different um, mayors, multilateral environment agreements, it's just not a good policy to have. It's not just a, a stylish way of living for us to have. Uh, it, it all leads to, we all do this because we want it to eventually translate into um, the, the good health, good proper well-being of our citizens. So we do whatever we do because we know our citizens have to be protected from the impacts of climate. Uh, but our, our members uh, have worked on a, a very comprehensive uh, proposal that was introduced earlier this year in February to deal with the plastic pollution problem. And um, it's called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And uh, we think it's the most comprehensive uh, bill that's been introduced on the issue in Congress. And um, terrific, we've got some slides showing up. Uh, are they coming through here? Uh, we think it's the most comprehensive because uh, it really deals with this issue of plastic pollution from cradle to grave. One of the pieces here was kind of this international human rights and environmental justice component of the legislation. And how we get toward that was um, banning the export of uh, these plastic uh, waste and scraps that we had kind of, uh, that had allowed the United States for too long to ignore this issue. Talk about, I'm going to talk about the um, Senator Sullivan's views and his views are guided by what he feels um, will be able to pass um, in Congress um, at this moment in time. So if you can, um, if you can think about the uh, political situation in Washington, um, and um, if you can, if you can also uh, think a little bit about just um, the mechanics of being able to pass a bill 
in um, the Senate at this moment. Um, the bill that we're uh, working on is called Save Our Seas uh, 2.0. Um, there is a 1.0 I'll talk about a little bit. And um, the, the uh, main sponsors of the bill are Senator Sullivan, who, um, by the way, is, is part of the uh, keynote discussion that will be on the 25th. And so I want to want to take us from a great discussion about the United States, what's happening um, congressionally, and bring us to the Great Lakes and some binational discussion. Before I go forward, though, let me just introduce myself. So I'm Andrew Dentrum, the Senior Director of Policy at Shedd Aquarium. Um, just to provide you a little bit of context about why Shedd Aquarium is, in, is concerned and interested in this issue. Um, we we work very, very hard and have for 90 years now. We just uh, celebrated our anniversary this year of 90 years um, of working very, very hard on conservation issues, whether it's in, here in the United States, um, here on the Great Lakes. Uh, on, we sit right directly on Lake Michigan or internationally. We have a team of researchers that work um, regularly in the Bahamas uh, to protect our oceans. So. One of the most important things and something that I think is important for our work here is that all of our conservation work uh, uses science as our North Star. We also believe it's incredibly import important to share and educate um, and inspire our public, but also to, to develop the next generation of scientists um, and conservation leaders. Dr. Ruth Mueller is an Associate Professor of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, drawing on a background uh, in molecular biology and sociology, her work explores the interactions of science, technology, society, and policy with a specific focus on the relationship between the life sciences, social values, and policymaking. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, Bryce, and I hope we just can take it away from uh, the panel before, I think, um, that was super interesting. So thanks for having me, thanks for having us. Um, um, I'll present the project that we are working on, uh, Ruth and me, uh, which is called Plastics Public Politics and the, initi the research initiative, uh, what it's, where it's part of. We are part of a big research initiative, which is called Plastic in the Environment Sources Reduction Solutions. So that's a large scale German research initiative funded by the German Ministry for Education and Research that funding that means about 37 million in furious and it funded uh, 20 research consortia with more than 100 institutions participating from science industry civil society and public ad administration so my goal today is to take you on a very fast journey of how ocean conservancy has paired science and policy for effective advocacy and then offer a few personal reflections at the end um, science is a really big part of Ocean Conservancy's DNA, and it feels right to me to start with the International Coastal Cleanup. Oh, since 1986, Ocean Conservancy has mobilized millions of people around the world to collect hundreds of millions of pounds of trash from beaches and waterways. Um, but what distinguishes this from other similar efforts is that our volunteers log what they find um, using either paper data cards or, in recent years, our app, CleanSwell. I was originally um, started out working with companies through the lens of the research organization I was with, the Five Gyres Institute. And that is where brands were coming to our organization saying, we really want to be a part of the solutions here, but we don't. And then the coalition of advocates was immense. And it just, the movement grew. This was easy to tap into the consumer's imagination. And it was also this, this factor, um, please don't, you know, it was it was with regards to sort of like this peer pressure campaign going on. And honestly, the brands put up a half-hearted fight. What I'm going to be talking about today is as the NOAA Marine Debris Program, what do we do to help help coordinate the federal efforts to reduce the impacts of marine debris in the United States? And so we were established in 2006 by Congress as the federal lead for marine debris in the United States through the um, 2006 Marine Debris Act. And then as we heard from Mary Eileen earlier, we were reauthorized in 2018 through the Save Our Seas Act. And our vision is that the global oceans and its coasts are free from the impacts of marine debris. And we work every day with our team to investigate and prevent those adverse impacts. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the new materials panel. Um, 
go ahead and advance. I'm dictating the slide advancement from afar. Uh, this is the plastics life cycle as uh, collated by a postdoctoral researcher in my group, Hoya Shang, soon to be faculty member at the University of Minnesota. And what you notice about it immediately is that the circular part takes up very little landscape on this image. And you might have seen something like this. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, today, I want to speak about our efforts to develop alternatives to toxic phthalates in PVC products. So. I want to introduce you to polyvinyl chloride, which I have to admit is not the most environmentally friendly um, polymer, but it is the third most popular thermoplastic being used right now. So it's called PVC or vinyl. The monomer is vinyl chloride. And you can see here we have like PVC piping is a very rigid material, whereas most consumer items are made out of flexible PVC. And this includes medical supplies such as tubing and blood bags, toys, uh, building materials such as these tile flooring, um, a lot of um, clothing and sports equipment and automobile dashboards are made out of PVC. Um, and so today I want to tell a story about some steps that our group at Illinois has taken towards realizing some strategies uh, um, to enable recycling and trigger degradation of polymers and composite materials. Um, and so my talk will consist of three sections. So I'll give a very brief inspiration and an introduction into metastable polymers, and then talk about the strategies in which we've taken to be able to recycle these materials. And then finally, I'll look into some trigger degradation strategies that we've developed at Illinois. So some of the questions we've been thinking about uh, now for the past couple of years um, are, are listed here. So, so the first one I think is, and this is a, you know, sort of a particularly a goal of my lab is, is to ask how can we convert existing plastics into degradable recyclable versions without requiring major changes to manufacturing workflows and at low cost. So um, the first talk you show gave a beautiful example, I, I think of basically what we want to do um, in the context of plasticizers there. So just basically sprinkling in a little bit of a co-monomer in a PVC polymerization that now gives you control over glass transition temperature. That's conceptually the same thing that we wanna be able to do. The dream would be to add a minimal amount of something that is low cost, um, safe, et cetera, that works with existing manufacturing uh, workflows, but now gives you a material that is recyclable or remoldable, um, but without any other major changes to its uh, production. Yeah, so my talk is going to be a little bit different than all of the prior talks um, because I'm going to be talking about the highlights of some of our investigators' work in the area of polymeric materials and degrading those polymeric materials. Um, and so I'm um, kind of a collection of things to, to talk about that hopefully will span some interests. I welcome everybody to the last uh, session we have of the day, but as you've heard, lots of good content tomorrow and follow up on the session that happened previously. Uh, so really looking forward to the, to the discussion that we'll, we'll have this afternoon here. Uh, in particular, I felt like there were a lot of uh, moments from the previous session on, on new materials that really parlayed well into this session. Some questions that were in the Slido that didn't get answered, we'll maybe try to take on in our session today about how do, the, how do new materials influence recycling infrastructure? Um, how do they affect how things persist in the environment? So I think there's some nice opportunities to, to pull some themes in from, from the previous session. So I'm very much looking forward to it. I would really like to, so I'd like to address um, the question, why aren't we managing plastics through our waste systems and explain what DOE is doing to tackle those challenges. So we're a very large agency. Um, we do have many different mandates, but there's several divisions um, that fund research to solve um, to solve problems within the plastic waste accumulation issue. Um, there are three big groups that fund research. So I'm gonna tell you about all of those um, and so pr provide some recent success stories and then conclude with the best ways to work with us. Uh, just real quickly on sort of the uh, vision and mission of the Bottle Consortium. Uh, our vision is to um, work towards technology development that will ultimately enable um, selective scalable uh, technologies um, that will uh, ultimately enable cost-effective recycling, upcycling, and increased energy efficiency in how we um, make and uh, deal with plastics at the end of life. 
And our mission is, is two components with sort of a very fuzzy and porous interface between them. Uh, first, we want to deal with, we want to develop processes that deal with um, upcycling, uh, deconstructing and upcycling today's plastics. Uh, and then as Nicole mentioned uh, earlier, is also to focus on how do we incorporate both bio-based um, inputs as well as um, intermediates derived from waste plastics uh, to, re to make tomorrow's plastics recyclable by design. And I'm gonna to talk to you today a little bit about the end of life challenges, uh, but from an environmental perspective, you know, what happens when these materials leak out into the environment? Uh, how do they break down? What do they break down into uh, and where do they go? So to me, you know, one of the most important aspects of this environmental issue um, is understanding how long plastics last in the environment. And this concept is known as persistence. Uh, and today I wanna to share with you a review that my colleagues and I published actually last week. Essentially what this means is that only microbes are capable of mineralizing or converting organic carbon that is in plastic to CO2. And last year we put out a, a paper demonstrating that sunlight could do this process as well. So sunlight has the capability to transform polystyrene into uh, water soluble products as well as CO2. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the state and local policy breakout session. I'm Kelly Chris. I'm the Director of Conservation Policy and Leadership at the New England Aquarium right here in Boston, Massachusetts. I love this video that I'm going to show you. I think it does a great job of showing how the work we do is based in science, how we work with youth, and how we work with the city. So Rosalia Project's mission is to clean and protect the ocean. We've been working on marine debris for the last 11 years now. We use multiple angles to do our work. So that means data cleanups, prevention through education, innovation and technology, and solutions-based research. We do that from the surface to sea floor and along the shoreline, in urban and coastal waters specifically. And in marine debris, we've been working on derelict fishing gear, consumer debris, and microplastics. We get to do this all over the place, all over the world really, but in the summer from a sailing oceanographic research vessel uh, home ported in Kittery, Maine, uh, primarily Gulf of Maine, but really our operating area has been New York to Bar Harbor. And we're the team that brought you the consumer solution to microfiber pollution, the Corobar. Um, real quick on PERG as an organization in my role, so the PERGs are a network of nonprofits operating across the country. And our network includes a number of chapters like MassPerg in Massachusetts, where I suspect many of you are. Uh, Illinois Perg in Illinois, CalPerg in California, you get the idea. Uh, our naming system is very uh, utilitarian. <laughs> uh, for decades, we have advocated for solutions to reduce waste, including many of the early bottle deposit laws in Massachusetts and Oregon, for example. And we've continued to work on reducing waste since then. In 2016, we started a national program to coordinate our waste reduction efforts across states and also work at the federal level. And I get to lead that program. And initially our work on plastic pollution was inspired um, a lot by our public audiences who brought this issue to us. We saw how the issue really resonated with our guests and our online followers. And that led us to learn more about it as an institution so we could help inform conservation action of our audiences. And so today I'm going to concentrate on a couple themes that I think are relevant um, uh, for the policy trends we've seen here in California. Achieve what we achieved here in South Carolina in the face of so much adversary. Um, I put together a case study with my team and also Kelly Thorvalson at the South Carolina Aquarium to understand how were we able to accomplish this given the stats that I'm about ready to share with you right now. Welcome here, and, and then um, Philip, you said you're with MIT or with the, part, part of the program? Or? I'm with MIT in the uh, Federal Relations Office in Washington. Federal oh, okay. here in Washington. Okay, terrific. Okay, that's why you look familiar. Okay. Yeah. And I All see right. uh, Kimmy B. Hello. Hi, Kimmy B. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I've got yep. some questions. We have a very small informal group here. Uh, so just, uh, we're taking it informally. You want to tell us who you are? 
Yeah, uh, my name is Kimberly. Um, I come out of the plastics industry. I spent 20 years there, um, had some kids and left, but now I'm coming in. Um, I worked in testing, uh, testing facility, Intertech now. Um, so I'm very familiar with, you know, the different markets and where plastics are, but now I'm more interested in sort of sustainability and sort of shape, shifting uh, direction a little bit. I'll, I'll add that, you know, the, you know, like like some of these other kind of coalitions and groups, and I and I think that they started with a really good goal and a mission, um, you know. But all all of these things that they're setting out are these kind of voluntary um, uh, dates and and things that they're trying to accomplish, um, which which is great if we can you know try to get people there, and if and if just setting out a a broad target to to shoot for is enough, great. <laughs> Historically, that hasn't really been the case, particularly with industry and plastic goals. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll jump into just from the government perspective, because I, you know, a lot of what we do is around messaging. So probably not as specific as, as what you're, you're talking about, but um, I do think it's important that we kind of recognize that this material is important. Like it's done a lot of good things for the world in terms of you know health and safety and fuel efficiency so like they're all there are positive the, the material plastic is not inherently like a terrible thing it's just the maybe how much we use and how we dispose of it and how just pervasive it's become so i think that's an important piece to recognize there is value it's just we have to be responsible for kind of our consumption habits and then for how we um, how we dispose of things and then also in terms of the producers to really put some pressure in terms of helping with the recycling infrastructure or recovery or reuse you know how do we get value back from these products and not just kind of toss them out into the world My starting point is that plastic pollution is obviously a global problem, but it's also a challenge for governing shared global commons like the ocean. And that's the part that I'm especially interested in, specifically the garbage patches that are accumulating in the high seas and also accumulations of plastic debris on the sea floor. So I'm not gonna go over the problems caused by marine plastic debris because I'm sure you're already familiar with those. Instead, I'll do two things. Um, first, I'll review the existing rules from the ocean governance regime that are designed and intended to reduce flows of plastic into the ocean. And then the second thing is I'll sort of wade into this debate about whether we need and can get a new international legally binding instrument to tackle marine plastic debris. So my presentation will focus on how the life cycle of plastics could be addressed at the international level whether that be in a form of an international agreement or, uh, or could that be some sort of a voluntary framework? Um, and uh, I think uh, in terms of the NGOs uh, here in the Pacific, there's very, very few of us that actually uh, work in terms of plastic policy. So um, uh, as my, one of my roles is actually to, to develop and uh, plastic uh, policy positions and recommendations uh, for WWF uh, here in the Pacific and also facilitate the advocacy work with the, the various Pacific Island countries. Um, and I'm Noelle Celine, I'm faculty at MIT and the Institute for Data Systems and Society and Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences. Um, and my expertise bridges science and policy on um, issues of toxic chemicals. Uh, I've worked a lot with the Minamata Convention on Mercury as well. I'm uh, a, on the faculty at the University of Massachusetts in Boston and work on global environmental governance. At MIT, so Brad's a full professor in chemical engineering. Uh, he has his uh, degrees in chemical engineering, uh, undergraduate from MIT and PhD from Berkeley. Uh, Brad has a long list of awards, and I'm just highlighting a few of them here. Svetlana is actually a, a physicist, so she uh, has her degrees in radio physics and, and electronics. She um, from the uh, Kharkiv National University in Ukraine. She also has a degree in patent law and information technology, which I think will um, add some interesting color to this discussion as we try to think about how public policy can shape um, material strategies and, and really think about it innovating across the materials life cycle for plastics. Um, Svetlana also, um, her, her PhD is in physics and mathematics. 
also from the Krakow National University in the Ukraine. Um, and this is just one slide to I can highlight the work that goes on in Svetlana's research group um, on sustainable fabrics, where uh, there's a, a draw to try and transition truly reused materials into novel uh, clothing. So, so finding secondary market, markets for recyclable materials, um, I think more, more generally. Uh, and this has been acknowledged with uh, innovation awards, which you can see in the lower right hand corner. Okay, um, I am with the Recycling Partnership, like I mentioned. We're a national nonprofit that works to advance recycling in the US. And we do that by putting private dollars to work in communities. These are our funding partners. Um, we have quite a few of them, I won't list them all, but just wanted to point out that they're from all across the recycling supply chain. So we have brands you'll recognize like Coca-Cola and retailers like Walmart and Target. Um, but we also have companies that handle recyclables um, from the time it hits the curb all the way through the process to becoming a new product. I am Luke Kretschmann with uh, Draper. Some of you may know us as the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory, but we are a not-for-profit uh, research and development organization in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we have been working on new uh, approaches to microplastic sensing uh, with the ultimate goal of uh, having a, uh, a capability to do sensing in the field in real time. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why we think that is important to do and uh, uh, some, uh, some highlights from what we've uh, been researching. Coronavirus pandemic has had a, a remarkable impact, uh, not only on our um, productive and social systems, but also on our path uh, to sustainability. So uh, before the uh, pandemic, uh, uh, there was a, a sure perception on the need uh, for a change, uh, also thanks uh, to the protests, especially the a youth protest and uh, we saw an increasing change of uh, consumers uh, habits uh, more attention for uh, uh, recycle uh, for sustainable products uh, also for solutions uh, based on uh, uh, circular economy to reduce uh, for instance uh, packaging and uh, this attention was also present uh, somehow at uh, uh, institutional level Welcome everyone. My name is John Fernandez. I'm the director of the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative. Welcome to the People on the Planet event sponsored by the Environmental Solutions Initiative. Um, this is uh, also the last event of our workshop on plastics in the environment, science meets policy. And a word about that and the lecture series, People on the Planet. At the Environmental Solutions Initiative at MIT, we take seriously the idea that policy, thinking and formulation and implementation runs alongside science and engineering and business. Professor Leah Stokes is an assistant, assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and affiliated with the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management and the Environmental Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And in terms of the issues that we'll be focusing a lot on today, um, namely plastics pollution, uh, Secretary Padilla has led the plastic ban legislation in California when he was a state senator. So thanks so much for joining us, Secretary um, Padilla. And um, now I'll introduce our second distinguished guest, which is uh, Senator Sullivan. So Senator Dan Sullivan was sworn in as Alaska's eighth United States Senator on January 6th, 2015, and he serves on the Armed Services Committee where he is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Readiness. In addition to that work, he is also on the Environment and Public Works Committee, on the Veteran Affairs Committee, and the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, where he is chairman of the Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmosphere, Fisheries, and the Coast Guard. Uh, so great to be part of this discussion. And before I do a deep dive into the specifics of my uh, uh, plastic ban phase out legislation from when I was in the legislature, uh, I did want to spend a couple of minutes, I think, setting the context for a discussion like this, uh, right? Because it's uh, uh, where the exception, unfortunately, not the rule when you take uh, scientists, engineers and put them into 
prominent policy making roles. I've served with a lot of colleagues over the years that have their law degrees or their history degrees or you know, bring even maybe private sector business experience, which is all good, uh, but not enough of a perspective uh, and uh, uh, informed insight on how science and technology impacts everything. So now we'll turn it over to um, Senator Sullivan to give us some opening remarks um, about his view on some of these issues that we're talking about today. Sure. Uh, thank you, Professor Stokes and Secretary Padilla and uh, all the other uh, attendees. Uh, this is a really important topic. I'm really glad that you are hosting us. And I think hopefully you're going to be a little bit uh, surprised by the way I talk about it, because I, I, I like to talk about this issue of cleaning up our oceans, the ocean debris challenge as a parable for how things can actually work in Washington. Bipartisan group of senators uh, working together with uh, environmental groups, industry groups, uh, the executive branch, and uh, starting to get a result. So let me talk a little bit about it. But first, you know, Mr. Secretary, you know, you probably know in the Senate, we like to kind of jab and hook with our states. So one of the bragging, I mean, um, one of the issues that's so important to me as a senator from Alaska is uh, my state has more coastline than the rest of the lower 48 states combined. So for those of you who've been to Alaska, you know that uh, there's a lot of coastline. So that's a really <laughs> important issue. This is a huge issue for Alaskans. 